Dick, I thank you so much for those kind words and the memories, which were almost 100% inaccurate. <laughs> He's told that story, and he gets it wrong every single time. The, the, the fact was, he was, as he suggested, a young academic, and I didn't need one. <laughs> so he went to work for my dear friend Bill Steiger, God bless him, and, and uh, did a great job there. And, and, and he also got it wrong when he said, my secretary said, is there a guy named Cheney here? Come on in. The person who actually went and asked him to come in was another fellow, young fellow working for me, named Frank Carlucci, who was, who was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Defense and Deputy Secretary of Defense later. I suspect that a good many folks here would agree that we've just heard from the, the finest Vice President of the United States in modern history. Now, Joe, Joe Biden would have something to say about that. But Joe Biden would have to, something to say about everything. <laughs> you know, they say in Washington, if you want to have a friend, buy a dog. The Rumsfeld corollary to that is, buy a small one, because it might turn on you. But in this case, it's not so. I, uh, Dick and I have been friends, as he said, for 40 years, which may be something of a record in this city. It was my good fortune to find this friend at a very early stage in his public service and my public service, and one who's been a model for all of us in his steadfast defense of our country. You know, I... I I look at the many oh, current administration's reversals of their announced policies on national security issues, Guantanamo Bay, military commissions, indefinite detention, CIA drone strikes. It makes me wonder if Dick has had more influence on President Obama th than the people who got him elected. I only wish the President had talked to Dick about health care. It would have saved us all a lot of trouble. The truth is that few people have done more over this past decade to correct what needs correcting, to remind American people of what strong, principled, conservative leadership looks like than Dick Cheney. And, in, in, and Dick, in case you were wondering, I think there's probably still time for you to file some paperwork for Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, my thanks to David and to the American Conservative Union and, and uh, for your invitation, for your years of dedicated leadership of the conservative movement. You're committed to the big tent concept of Ronald Reagan and Bill Buckley and to the free exchange of ideas. I commend you for standing up for those time-honored principles. It's good to be here. I have been around so long that I remember a time when CPAC did not exist, <clears throat> when Ronald Reagan was still an actor, when Barry Goldwater was our candidate for president, and we only worried about socialism outside of the United States. Now, I'm honored to receive this Defender of the Constitution Award and especially to be with so many people who understand how important it is for us all to defend the Constitution. The people in this room I know keep that flame burning and inspire so many millions of Americans who share in our belief in limited government, a strong national defense, and a sound fiscal base for a growing economy. And, and our thoughts today are with the many thousands of other defenders of our Constitution who are not in this room 
or even in this country. They're thousands of miles away, risking their lives to protect our free society. The enemy they face is radical Islamism, the totalitarian is, is ideology that exalts death and loathes our values and the ideals we cherish. So if it's all right with you, I would like to share this award with the men and women of the United States Armed Forces. Every single one is a volunteer. Every single one is doing what they're doing because they want to serve this country. Every single one raised their hand and said, send me. We know they're doing their part to defend our freedoms, and so too must we. Today, Americans face a national reckoning, really quite unlike anything I've seen in my lifetime, a lifetime that now spans one-third of the history of our country. That is amazing. What a young country we have, or what an old man I am, or both. The challenges we face at home is the gentle despotism of big government, big spending, and big deficits. This appetite for boundless government, often born of good intentions, is couched in languages of compassion. But left unchecked, it can steadily erode our freedom and mortgage our country's financial independence, and in the end, erase our proud culture of individual responsibility. No society has ever spent its way to prosperity. Yet today, there are those in Washington who seem intent on trying to prove that America can be the first to do so. We need to look no farther than Western Europe. Might I even say old Europe? I think I did that once, and I, I caught a little Dickens for it. But we really do need to, to look to see if our future, we should continue on this course. There we see governments burdened by crushing debt, cradle-to-grave social welfare programs, and societies willingly ceding their sovereignty and voting responsibilities to faceless transnational bureaucracies. No American administration should see that as a model to replicate. The recklessness of big government spending, trillion dollar budgets, bailouts to Wall Street and Detroit, and an irresponsible use of earmarks have taken a toll on our fiscal health. When I served in Congress in the 1960s, the United States has the, had the first federal budget of $100 billion. Not a $100 billion debt or a $100 billion deficit, but a budget of $100 billion when Lyndon Baines Johnson was president. And the country gasped at the thought of a $100 billion budget. You know, these days that's barely enough to pay for Obama's teleprompters. <laughs> With this most recent election, the American people have had an opportunity to again demonstrate what principled conservatism is really about and what it can achieve. The energy and drive of the Tea Party movement has brought needed recalibration to our party and to our cause. The task now is to be persuasive without being uncivil and to promote candidates who believe in American exceptionalism, men and women who believe in our country are proud of our country, 
and not just for the first time when they happen to be 